In this screencast, I want to reflect on the terminology we use to describe the phases of the gate cycle. I'm going to start off by suggesting that we keep things as simple as possible. Having done this, though, I want to reflect on the conventional terminology that's been used in clinical gait analysis for the last 20 years. I think it's got some fairly serious limitations. It'll be interesting to see what you think. Let's start off by considering the gait cycle from the perspective of one side. It doesn't matter which, but we'll choose the left and denote this using the colour red. By convention, the gait cycle starts from one foot contact and proceeds to the next. We no longer use the term heel strike because many patients do not make contact with the heel and most of us place the foot on the ground rather than striking it. During the first part of the gait cycle, about 60% for most of us, the foot that made contact with the ground remains in contact with the ground. We call this stance. It ends, naturally enough, with foot off. After foot off is the swing phase, when the limb is moved forwards, ready for the next stride. Foot contact and foot off are called gait events. To subdivide the left gait cycle further, we need to consider what is happening on the right side. We'll denote this with the colour blue. First, let's extend our left side events so we can see clearly what is happening. The right foot makes contact with the floor about halfway through the left gait cycle and then goes through exactly the same cycle of events as the left side did. Right foot contact is referred to as opposite foot contact in relation to the left gait cycle. The previous right gait cycle can also be depicted. From this we can see where right foot off occurs in relation to the left gait cycle. As you'll have guessed, this is called opposite foot off. The combination of the gait events for both sides thus divides the gait cycle into four phases. The cycle starts with first double support when both feet are in contact with the ground. Then comes single support when the opposite leg is swinging, followed by another second double support period when both feet are again in contact with the ground. The final phase is swing, which corresponds to single support on the other limb. We can expand the left gait cycle and plot the phases we've identified so far. First double support, single support, second double support, and swing. You'll notice that single support and swing are quite long phases which require further subdivision. A variety of methods have been explored for doing this, but none of them lead for sensible definitions that hold for normal walking and for walking with pathology of different kinds. Given this, I suggest that we just divide these into three phases of equal duration. We'll call these early, middle and late to distinguish them from earlier schemes that use terms such as initial and terminal. Note that early single support on one side corresponds to early swing on the other, middle single support corresponds to middle swing, and late single support to late swing. We often want to refer to these phases succinctly and I suggest these three letter abbreviations. So that's my recommendations for how we should be subdividing the gait cycle into phases. Let's now turn to what I'll refer to as the conventional terminology. This was developed by the Ranchos Los Amigos Gait Analysis Committee and was most fully reported in Jacqueline Perry's book, Gait Analysis, Normal and Pathological Function. It's been incorporated into most of the major textbooks since then. Let's have a look at some of the issues with its use. This is the illustration of the terminology adapted from the latest edition of Perry's book. It illustrates periods, phases and tasks, but today I'd like to concentrate on the periods and phases. There are five phases that comprise stance and another three that comprise swing. Before we go any further, it may be useful to plot these on the timeline we looked at earlier, with a thicker line representing the stance and a thinner one swing. We can then look at the relative timings of the eight phases. Perhaps the first thing we recognise is that initial contact is very short, just 2% of the gait cycle. Using the technology available at the time for kinematic data capture, that is less than the interval between two frames of data. In reality, initial contact is, is an event that happens at an instant in time. We call this foot contact and I can't really see why we need to invent an extremely short phase of the gait cycle as well. For clarity, we'll delete this from the timeline. That leaves loading response as the next phase. My quibble here is with the words used. 
A response, to my mind, is what happens after an event. Simplistically, then, loading response is what happens after loading. But let's put the vertical component of a typical ground reaction above the timeline. You'll see quite clearly that loading continues throughout this phase. If we want to consider this as loading response, then we find that much of the response is occurring before the loading. Maximum load actually occurs well into the next phase of the cycle. Mid-stance is the next event. The curious thing about mid-stance is that it is not in the middle of stance, as marked by this arrow. Mid-stance is actually the phase leading up to the middle of stance. There is a similar issue with terminal stance. It doesn't mark the end of stance. In fact, there is another whole phase pre-swing after terminal stance, but before the foot leaves the ground. I think these two definitions are particularly problematic because I suspect that most clinicians who aren't gait analysts, and indeed many who are when they're talking casually, actually use phrases such as mid-stance and terminal stance with their common sense meaning rather than this technical definition. This means that we're often not sure exactly which phase of the gait cycle people are referring to when they use one of these terms. One concept I really do like is that of pre-swing, which I think has inspired terminology. It really emphasises the cyclic nature of the gait cycle and the way in which the most important function at the end of the stance phase is to prepare for swing. Given this though, I wonder why the originators of the system did not refer to the last part of swing as pre-stance. Perry and Gage together both recognise the importance of pre-positioning the leg in the swing limb before stance, and it surprises me that this hasn't been incorporated into the terminology for the gait cycle. At one level, nothing could seem simpler than dividing swing into three phases. There is an issue here though. Swing on one leg occurs at the same time as single support on the other. Swing is divided into three phases, but single support is only divided into two. The same time interval is thus divided into a different number of phases, depending on whether you're looking at it from the perspective of the stance limb or the swing limb. There are some minor technical issues with the precise definition of the phases. The end of one phase is not necessarily defined in the manner as the start of the next phase, which can lead to ambiguity. Mid-stance ends when body weight is aligned over the forefoot, for example, whereas the next phase, terminal stance, starts with heel rise. What happens if these don't occur at the same time? A related issue is that the precise definitions of some phases are only relevant to normal walking. If a patient walks in equinus and the heel never contacts the ground, then how can heel rise be used to determine the start of terminal stance? Similarly, mid-swing is defined as starting when the tibia is vertical, yet in many patients walking in a crouched gait pattern, the tibia may never become vertical. In this screencast, we've looked at two different ways of dividing the gait cycle into phases. It's up to you now. Which one are you going to use?